You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you've got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? Welcome to another episode of the Magna Method Podcast, a podcast that strives to deliver inspiring stories of hard work, perseverance, and a commitment to excellence. Today's guest on the show is Pete Sousa. Pete is currently a news anchor and journalist for KWTX in Waco, Texas, and has an extensive history in public relations work with most of the major professional sports organizations, such as the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, and the NCAA. He is also the host of the entertaining and motivational podcast, The Payoff with Pete, where he interviews many inspiring and incredible people who share stories of overcoming alcohol and drug addictions. This reuniting discussion between Mark and Pete delivers some great insight to self-awareness, humility, and valuing what's right in front of you. You can find the Mega Method podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment to let us know how the Magna Method podcast has influenced you. All right, so let's let's just start this up. First of all, um, I'm so excited to have you on the show, Pete, because we are lifelong friends who met. Lifelong. <laughs> Seriously, crazy to say that. I know, but it's true. Who met? Yeah. Who met at the university? Met at the University of Richmond uh, through the football program. And you were, when we met, you were instantly one of my favorite people because of your spirit, because of your energy. And you're just an all-around great human being. Um, we could tell stories, and I know we're going to get into some of those stories, but um, <laughs> let's, let's talk to us. Uh, first of all, you know i got to say it. I, this, uh, this is a, a humbling moment for me to be a part of this, to, any, any, to be a part of your life and to be in this orbit is an honor and uh that is no that's no bs it, it means a lot to be to be a part of this and to be talking with you wow. to be talking to be catching up with a with an old teammate who i consider family um and a, and a good friend uh means a lot but also to be considered for something like this is is awfully cool well thank you for saying that but <clears throat> i'm gonna let the audience in on something at the university of richmond um on game days a lot of families come in my mother was back home working a couple jobs so she didn't get to come down very often she came down i think once to drop me off as a freshman and once as a senior when i was presented with the dudley award and there were a lot of great families that i became a part of and one of them was the Sousa family and i remember your father and mother taking me out to eat at the outback steakhouse and, yeah. I, and it's like you think about it it sounds so small and not important but it was so important to be a part of someone's extended family and I can't even tell you how what that meant to me at the time one will never know but I'm telling you now that it was incredibly special so thank you um, yeah well it's it's so ironic how that works out you know my father always talked about you because you were from Massachusetts and he was from Connecticut and uh, you know the, the story goes and it, you, you said to my father you said you know Sousa you guys have your own phone book where I'm from and <laughs> my father always repeated that line he loved it because he had friends from Connecticut and Massachusetts my dad's Portuguese a lot of Portuguese people from the Northeast and there, there was that instant family vibe too Oh man, it was the best of times, and um, I know we're going to talk a lot about that. But let's talk about what you've been doing uh, since Richmond, and, and about your life. And Pete is a is an anchor uh, on the news. He's going to tell us all about that. But it was very interesting. Maybe you want to start with you know what took you away from football, which kind of set your pathway. No. Yeah, well, I mean, getting sober, that's what we're talking about, right? Well, um, first, first, I think it's important to let people know that Pete was a stud high school football player from Philadelphia, and he looks like a superhuman when he shows up, 
And we're super excited to have a wonderful addition to our team, great person, great athlete, great contributor, and then he finds out he can't play. So maybe start there. Oh, man, it sucked. I, uh, it's funny. I still think it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me in a sense that it just put me on my path. And I think I do believe that there's a plan for all of us. And embracing that plan and doing your part is what it's all what it's all about. You, you know, you can have all the faith in the world, but you, you know, faith without works is dead. Uh, and so it's not like this this you know situation happened to me, and, and I and I was like, oh man, you know, I, I I think I always had a good attitude. But the situation Mark's talking about is I was you know good football player. I was going to going to play football in college. I'd already. Uh, had committed to the University of Richmond. And, and Mark, did you play in any of those summer All-Star games? For high school? Yeah, yeah. I, I played in a uh, the Shriners game. It's a big game in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, we were, it was kind of new. We had the Big 33. I, I remember that game, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I wasn't good enough to play in, but uh, that, <laughs> was, that was huge. And then we had, like, this new city All-Star game called the Hero Bowl. And I was tapped to play in that. Part of it was you have to go get a physical to play in the game. And I went to get the physical. It was after Memorial Day. And, I, you know, it still isn't – I'm still not quite sure of, as to exactly what contributed to this health situation. But I was, going, I was going to get the physical. And a doctor, not a cardiologist, just a, a physician, was listening. You know, you take your heartbeat. And honestly, man, I remember leading up to that year, I hadn't had like a real good physical. It was one of those things where I was kind of uh, working against the clock. I had to get a, a paper, a, a sheet filled out. And I went to some doctor who maybe listened to my heart for a second and, you know, whatever. Hey, like, you know, count to three or backwards, who knows. But anyways, I got this sheet filled out. So I passed my physical for my senior year to play football. So now I'm getting the first real physical uh, or doctor's appointment I've had. And I don't know how long. And this guy... Uh, that's the doctor for this all-star game tells me your heart is beating funny. It's got some kind of arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't clear you to play in this game. I need you to see a cardiologist. And I didn't think anything of it, man. I was actually relieved. You know, I was in party mode at that point. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was. I mean, we've been down, you know, being from Philly, I'm from outside of Philadelphia, like, like Villanova, Bryn Mawr area, but you go to the Jersey shore um, it's like all the people that I played against in the Philadelphia Catholic League and people from public and private schools. Everybody kind of goes down there. And uh, I was partying down there. And so I, I wasn't really thinking much of it. So the guy said you had to get another – you had to see the cardiologist. And then, dude, I went to see the cardiologist. And I remember they gave me a stress test, which is where you run on the machine and you have all the wires connected to you. They gave you – gave me an – or back then it was wires on you know, now it's a little different. Uh, they gave me a, a uh, an echocardiogram and an EKG. And once I remember when I was doing the stress test and I was running on the treadmill and they were looking at my heart. I, I, I As a kid, I remember looking at the cardiologist who was looking at his nurse or whatever, uh, his assistant, and I knew something was wrong mm -hmm. by the looks on their faces. And Something was really was wrong, dude. And it was like, you don't even want to acknowledge it. I still don't like to acknowledge it. But my heart was beating uh, like it was it was extremely weak. Uh, and, uh, you know, now I, at the, I, Pete, at the time, I have to stop you. Did you feel anything? You know, looking back, yeah, I did. I kind of felt fatigued. Uh, towards this, this I, I, I've been partying a lot. I've also been working out. You know, you're lifting heavy weights because. I was a defensive end. I was a little bigger. Mm -hmm. And so I had felt some sort of fatigue, but I didn't know that anything was wrong. I just thought that I was, you know, tired a lot. I was partying a lot. I was, I was working pretty hard. So no, I didn't, I didn't think anything was wrong with me. Honestly, if anything, I was, I thought I was invincible. Like we all do at that age. Of course. Yeah. Um, and my heart was just not being, it was beating at like 20%. Where, and, and so they were like, you know, the people that, have this the strength of this heart of, of the heart like this or the weakness of the heart like this you know they can sometimes they're bedridden 
uh, you have something called uh, cardiomyopathy. Mm. And this is right after Reggie Lewis had died, you know, being from, from course, Massachusetts, oh, yeah. Boston. You oh, can't yeah. ever forget that. You can't forget Hank Gathers passing away. Uh, people had started to drop dead from this stuff. So doctors were super cautious. So the moment they figured out what was wrong with me, they were like, you know, you're not going to play in this game, but you may never play football again. And that was like, whoa, because, you know, if, I don't know if you were like me, but my whole identity was wrapped up into that stuff. So it was like, I, I honestly, I never even stopped to acknowledge it. I just kept partying and acting like I was going to play football again. Wow. Well, well, and at what point do you realize, like, it's doubtful, like it's not happening? Because that's a, listen, if that happened to me, oof, man, I'm. Oh, dude, I, if you remember, I was, you know, so I get to Richmond and, you know, I'm on full scholarship, right? Just like you. And, but now I'm the guy that's on full scholarship that's not playing. But I look like I'm totally healthy. I mean, I'm asymptomatic, right? So. I'm this guy that looks like, I don't know what to say, picture of health, but I looked like I was 100%. And I felt like I was 100%, but I'm being told I'm not. And, you know, my teammates, you know, guys are going out playing against Mark Magna um, on the scout team. And, and, you know, Matt Davis is getting his ass kicked, you know, mm -hmm. not because Matt Davis isn't a good player, but because Matt Davis is a freshman and he's playing with a bunch of, scout team guys against the first team defense and you know Todd McSherry is getting his ass kicked and Rob Bella is getting his ass kicked and even a guy like Paris Lennon everybody is having to slog it out in summer camp guys going down and here I am just sitting there you know on full scholarship holding a clipboard so people are looking at me like I think as as young guys they couldn't help but to be like what the hell is this guy's deal I remember one time I got into like a shoving match with Paris Lennon in the locker room <laughs> Because I think, you know, That's I was funny. scared. I was, <laughs> That's funny. I had to write his name. They gave me shit to do, these coaches, right? Like, he's going to earn his scholarship. So they're like, write this, these guys' names on the board for the scout team. I didn't know. Paris spelled his name with two N's, you know? So I put one N, um, or it's vice versa. Uh, and uh, I got it wrong, and he was like, yo, man, you know how I spell my name? I was like, oh, gosh. You know, so now I got to stand up for myself. We're in the freshman locker room. And I think a lot of that was, at least for me, it could be misperceived. Paris and I ended up being good buddies. We lived right next to each other by the time we were seniors. But at that point, I, I, I perceived that as a resentment from, from guys that we're working hard, getting our asses kicked, and you're not doing shit. And, and, and you know, too, I had a positive attitude. So Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so people were like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? I mean, Mark, you remember, you were always really supportive, and I'm not just saying that because we're talking. Uh, you were always real supportive. And guys on the team were supportive. And to go back to what you, it's a long answer to your question, but I was told that there was a chance I was going to play for the first like two years. Really? So I would work out with the team. I would, I would lift with you guys. They were like, you know, no like jarring um, activity. So like playing basketball was out, but I still would do all this shit. Of you course, know, so yeah. was drinking and, and smoking weed. I did that all, all that all the time. You know, when I was in high school, I took speed before a football game, uh, and I played very well. Ooh. And, you know, I, that was something – that was one of those things where it was a total – it was a mind F in a sense where I thought that, okay, I need to take this stuff to be good. Of course. Uh, and then also it was like – it was a, it was <clears> a <throat> you know, if I take this stuff, I'll be the person I'm supposed to be. It'll make me as good as I'm supposed to be. And that is a lie. I know that now. Um you know that's a lie. Yeah, but 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 I tell you what, if you take that, you have a great game. Guess what? I'm taking it again. Yes. You know, and people yeah. people think that that's like, oh, that's it. dude. You you make a young person feel like they're invincible, and then they're productive, and then they're revered for it. it it's over. It's over. It's, it's over. It's kind of like when someone. I mean, I know we'll get into this, but where I grew up, there was a group of kids who were like gods because they were ridiculous athletes and they were respected. When they drank, they felt invincible, so they smoked pot, they did coke, they did recreational drugs of all kinds, prescription pills, and whenever they did those things, they felt like gods. So guess what? They kept doing it. So um, All the time, and you know, we know where that leads. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I remember I had a, it was a game, 
it was the day after Thanksgiving, uh, and our defensive coordinator, this guy John McGuire, who was really, it really helped me out. Was an influential guy when I was a kid. He got Pitt University of Pittsburgh to come look at me, and uh, I, I didn't have any. I I, I just wasn't motivated. Uh, I didn't have. Any, I didn't take any speed, and I played awful. And and honestly, looking back, that eats at me because I, you know, Mark, you were a guy, God. You gave a hundred and ninety-five percent every game, and every workout, and every moment. I appreciate and, it. Uh, well, it's the truth. And I had this this sickness. I don't know ego as a kid. I got my first letter from Temple University when I was a junior, and you would have thought that I got drafted number one in the NFL. Like I, <laughs> I, was, all I was all screwed up. That's a big so, deal. Yeah. That's a big deal, though. You know, people it, don't it, know is, that. it is, but I didn't know how to handle any kind of success. So I, I this coach from Pitt was there and I played awful and I remember my coach telling me you know were you hung over and I wasn't I just didn't play well um, and I remember attributing that to well if I, it's because I didn't take you know Adderall before yeah um, so that's I'm less than without that stuff well I mean it's, it's, so that that's where it starts Pete and then you know you get to Richmond uh, you know you get paired you can you get the responsibility of and I and I think this this is a very powerful lesson. I was talking to someone on our team here at Anatomy today, and I said, you know, everything happens for a reason. And then I started to think in my head, Pete Sousa didn't get to play football, and now he's an amazing anchor. Todd McShay didn't get to play football, ESPN. Joe Douglas didn't get to play at the next level. GM of an NFL team, it's not exactly terrible. You know what I mean? So no, and 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 so about, it's about like uh, dealing with the hand you were dealt and moving forward. Oh wow, powerful, really. Yeah. And so you you get dealt that hand, and after you maybe tell, let's talk about your role at Richmond that you took on, and then how yeah. it transitioned from there. Well, that was, and you know, I know you've had Coach Reed on here. Um, I'm going to have him again, uh, by the way, because I can't tell you how many people say they want to hear that man again. I'm not kidding. Dude, the guy is unbelievable. He is. He's unbelievable. And and look, this is something everybody needs to know. That guy puts his money where his mouth is. You know, he gave me a scholarship. He could have said, hey, we're, you know, and the NCAA, at least back in the day, they would renew scholarships once every year like there was kind of a technicality but if the university of richmond after all for me a scholarship that first year they could have put me out to pasture this guy can't play you know medically he isn't cleared we're not going to renew a scholarship coach Reed didn't do that and he knew i wasn't going to play and he not only did that but as a man he made sure that i stayed under the tent and with you guys he gave me responsibilities and one of the roles i had was breaking down film one of the roles i had was filming practice and i'll tell you when i had i had to you know, my freshman year, I sat on the sidelines. It didn't do much. I charted plays during games. But, mm-hmm. You know, I, they really didn't know what to do with me. Sophomore year, they were like, okay, we're going <laughs> to, if this guy's keeping a scholarship, we're going to stick his ass up in the tower and we're going to have him film practice. And I, that was a real ego blow. And when you're a kid, you don't even know what an ego blow is. You just know it doesn't feel good. Right. I didn't know how to process it. And I was pissed. And I would go up and film practice and. I was lucky that our boy McShay got, I, I was, no, this isn't lucky, but Todd had back issues and he basically had to walk away from the game and he and I were close. And I remember just kind of being like, Hey, like I me, mean, you could do this and you could work it out. And coach Reed brokered a deal with Todd. I, I, I think there was, you know, money put towards Scott's, uh, yeah, uh Todd's edu- yeah, Todd was on the podcast. Todd, Todd said, Hey, say, Hey, we can give you some money for food and books and paid for yeah. a little bit of this and you know so Todd yeah. went home so so Go yeah ahead. so that yeah and then that's kind of how I got paired up with Todd and and it helped me and, and it did also it gave me a, a, a broader I, I honestly had the best of both worlds at Richmond right because I was able to hang out with some of the frat kids and this isn't a positive but I would smoke weed with them and be with all different walks of life and then I was you guys were my family I mean the football team was I mean, you guys are still my brothers. And, and and so I had that incredible bond. But I also, you know, if you remember, Coach Reed was trying to push us all to get into fraternities because he wanted us to become, he just wanted people in the school invested in the football program and wanted right. us to experience right, right. the most of college we could. 
So, you know, you, you, you know, <laughs> there's so many stories, but, you know, you're, so you're filming and you, you know, just to tell you this, you'll always be family, you'll always be a brother, and you're one of the most important people in my life. And I don't talk to you a lot. We exchange social media uh, texts, but, you know, that, that it's so unique because I know that there's a bond that happens in college like that. And I think base it trickles down from the coach and it becomes something unique and extraordinary, and that's what makes it special. That being said, um, well, you share so much. Uh, you know, it, it, when you're getting, not everybody in the world is getting up at 4 a.m. and working out together, right? Right. No, nobody's really doing it alone, hardly, and damn, nobody is doing it at, at 18 through 21. So I think to, that that bond right there. And then being in the foxhole with other guys uh, is something that is unbreakable. Right, right, and and I think that you know that's those moments in that time there molded us, molded all of us in such a unique and positive way. And there's so many things like, and I talk about it all the time. And I, you know, I talk about Jim Reed attributes. Something that Coach Reed did well was he. I can make a power list, and I'm, I'm, I was going to do it today. I didn't have a much, I didn't have a lot of time this morning, but he wouldn't. He he saw people, in viewed or thought what's possible with that person. He saw them being bigger and more important and more successful than they probably thought of themselves. And I always thought that was so amazing. And I tell you about when he came into my house, and you know the story well. What he said to my mother, and my mother was like. You really think my son can do all those things? He said, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think he could do all those things. Yeah. So he yeah. made you believe those things, but he never minimized anyone. Like, there's kids there that he would call idiots because he thought the kid was an idiot because he saw that kid being a doctor or a lawyer or something huge in society, and the kid didn't think of himself that way. And today, Sam Kaufman's a lawyer. Right, yeah. Andrew Bogle's a doctor, and there's yeah. countless doctors and lawyers. I mean, there's so many success stories, but he wanted people to be more than what they thought they could be, and I thought that was an extraordinary skill and a gift. And he kept... well, and I think that's when he would get frustrated. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you had a chance to play for Bill Parcells, and and I always. I, I just love Bill Parcells. I don't know him like you like like you know him or know him, but, but I I just love motivate. I, look, man, I need people like that in my life. Bottom line, you, I don't know that you do, Mark. I mean, you're pretty much a self starter, man. I, I'm oh, we I all need it. Day. We all need it. Yeah, I get up sometimes. I'm looking for shortcuts, yeah. and you know that wasn't an option uh, with Coach Reed, and it wasn't an option with Coach Cohn, and wasn't an option with Coach Leonard or Coach Zamberlin or Coach London. I mean, it was, wasn't an option. And, and I'm telling you, man, I needed that. Uh, I still need it to right. some degree. Every, you know, I have, you know, and we'll talk about this. I have like a 12 step program, right? You know, I'm, I'm involved in recovery and that keeps me on task when I'm, when I'm choosing to, to do it as much as I should. Uh, which I, I don't know, man. Coach Reed was, he was the beginning of, we're so young and unassuming at the time. You, you don't, you really, I mean, looking back, you don't know what's good for you. Right. That, and then, uh, by the way, that, that's what I, I got to jump in. That's what I wanted to say. At the time, you, some of them, like, you, not only do you hate the experience, you hate the person dishing it out to you. And you yeah. think, you think that, you know what? I don't need this shit. I don't need any of this. This is not something I need. I don't need him barking at me. And the coaches are looking at you like, if you don't have this, do you have any idea where you're going to end up? And they're not wrong. They're not wrong because without that direction, discipline, and structure, do you think you could have pulled off what you're doing today? Honestly. No, I, 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 I always had that gear, um, which brought me back to like the fundamental. I knew, at least I knew what hard work looked like, right. you know, <laughs> and I knew what accountability looked like. Uh, and I had to, act myself into that thinking right uh it, the being accountable i couldn't just say hey i want to be accountable i had to learn how to do it um and it starts new every day right because some days I, I like i said i'm looking for shortcuts but it started that was the first time i was accountable and dude 
you know, I was, we talk about my, my drinking and stuff like that. The moment I, my, my addiction and all the alcohol really took off was the moment I was out of the nest. And I'm not talking about my parents' nest. I'm talking about Coach Reed's nest, mm -hmm. the Richmond football nest. You know, those guys, man, if I got under, a, or if we got like under a 2-0 or a 2-5, which is not good, right? But, right. If, but, but if our grades dipped, we, I was going to be sitting in study hall on Saturday afternoon in the spring, staring at the head coach. Yeah, yeah, fear. <laughs> it's called fear, fear. It's called fear, man. I mean, that's he kept us accountable. And, you know, I at the time would be like, oh, this guy doesn't want me to fail out because he doesn't want it to look poorly upon him. That guy wanted me to be the best I could possibly be. Hmm. That's so interesting and so powerful, Pete. Like, you know, it, it's kind of like, I tell the team here, like, you, 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 they think at times that we're pushing them to make the brand better and make the business better. And of course that's there. I understand that's a part of it. But at the end of the day, I was telling a story I spoke in Seattle about a month ago. And I said, you know, you think you, they're pushing you to build the brand. They're pushing you because you're probably behaving in a mediocre manner and you're not the best version of yourself. When you walk around and you take pride in your work, you straighten up the facility. When you ask, what else can I do to be helpful? You're practicing being a better person. Do you understand that? That's about you. That's not about the business. And if you don't do yeah. that now, you're not going to wake up at 40 and go, yeah, let me do that. You just won't. Yeah. You won't. No. So. None of that stuff happens overnight. And, and you might as well get busy doing it because it's fulfilling too. That's I right. Mean, that's right. It's, it, you want to have that. You, look, man, that's what you just described there. Those are all esteemable acts. And if you want to have genuine self-esteem, you have to do those esteemable acts so you feel good about yourself and you have a natural confidence that you has developed over time. Because when you're when you're you know, when you're not doing shit, you're ashamed of you're going to have confidence. Uh, and this is this is not, you know. <laughs> this is none of these thoughts are, or ideas are my own. I stole all this stuff, mm -hmm. but the, I've I've been around people who know more than me or have walked it before me, and uh, yeah, I, I I didn't understand it back then. I certainly didn't. I, I appreciated Coach Reed, and I liked you know I always liked them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always liked all our coaches, you know. And you and I have the have the luck. We have the good fortune of seeing our coaches. I saw Coach Leonard. I was working a football game. I, I know I sent you a picture at uh, in Colorado State. No, what was it? Utah State. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I do some freelance football, and I saw Coach Leonard, and I, I I just I had to go say hi to him before the game. I was down the field, and he was <laughs> so floored to see me. Uh, and you know, of course, right away I'm like, we're talking about keeping up the people. Mark Magna, very successful down in Miami. <laughs> very successful. I'm like, <laughs> oh man, I Joe can't. Douglas, general manager of the Jets. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, he was like uh, he was so proud. He was talking about, and I told him a great story. You know, my dad died a little while ago, and you brought up my father. And uh, this is the Richmond football family. I'm home with my girlfriend we had a, a year later we had a like a little get together and i didn't make a huge deal about uh that it was happening um and dude before the mass uh matt davis walks in like I, he drove from dc down to just did the down and oh back my goodness and he walked i was like it meant so much he comes in solo and i told coach leonard about that because this is probably about a month ago so that it just happened about a week later a week earlier and i could just tell on his face you, you know you can feel that he was just like so it's something you can't describe uh but it, when you're a part of it man it feels good and you got to keep tapping into it you got to keep having conversations like we're having and when you see a coach take the opportunity to go you know i told him and this was not of me i was like hey coach Leonard, just so you know you meant a lot to me you mean a lot to me i'm 10 years sober there are things that you did when i was a kid that I've carried with me through the rest of my life. And you had a real positive impact on me. And it's because it's true. And you might as well tell the person. Oh, man. I mean, um, you know, what you just said about Matt Davis, like, you know, there's a lot of that in that family that we came from. And it's even, you know, it, and we say it all the time, but it stems from Coach Reed. Matt Davis is a 
extraordinary dude. Oh, and he's one of my he's favorites. Just and he was like my little brother, and I, I yeah. love that guy. And I knew his older brother. Yeah. And I remember being in the room when his older brother came in to speak in a wheelchair. Yeah. And I remember Matt, like, by all accounts, Matt Davis committed to Richmond because of his brother. Everyone yeah, Matt Davis was recruited to play at Ohio State, yeah. Michigan State, yeah. Maryland. And when Maryland was real good, Maryland's bounced back. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah, oh my. I mean, Matt was a huge recruit and athlete. <laughs> he, was the best, he was the best high school football player, I think, in D.C. his senior year. He, he won the Timmy Award. That's right. I heard that. And, I, and every <laughs> Matt, Matt was great, man. I just love Matt. Like, we have so much in common. And he's just a great human being. And I'll tell you. Coach Reed took three planes to get to Richmond for my Hall of Fame service. And I remember. I was there. He said he couldn't make it. And then when he walked in, I was thinking, Coach Reed, he's a legend, man. He just oh. walked in. <laughs> yeah, he did. Like, <laughs> that is, he's a legend, man. Yeah. I mean, he truly is a legend. And, and for a guy like that, when he came, Mark, I think, to that ceremony, I'm pretty sure he was – coaching at Iowa yeah he was recruiting yeah so he was in the weeds but he, he made he made time to get to, to show up for I, he, I hear a voicemail I'm, I'm, I'm it's cold out I drove to the airport the airport shut down but I'm headed to another one <laughs> I'm thinking this guy's like it sounds like he's a nom but he's gonna make it it's very unlikely Oh, he's gonna make it yeah. you, you can always go down and back it's very unlikely coach Reed doesn't make it it, like it's the, you're better off like you know meeting Superman or something, but the, you know what? Do you remember what Coach Reed did on the way back from games? How he got back home? What do you mean? Well, University of Richmond is in one location. City Stadium is in another location. It's yeah, not well, exactly. So we, we, we would bus. Right? Yes, we would bus there. It's not exactly yeah. close, right? It's like far <laughs> away. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was probably what thirty minutes, twenty five minutes. If it's thirty minutes by a drive, I'm thinking it's at least seven eight miles. No. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. He would run back after the game. <laughs> That's stupid. So I completely forgot that. Yeah. So you think about what the energy it takes from a fifty plus year old man a college football game all week preparation up at four a.m. ready for the game game planning. We play the game. It's four hours. He runs home. I was like, because you you're, you're you're the guy that knows all about mental wellness and physical fitness. How the hell did he do that? I mean, how much was I think about this sometimes when I'm tired? How much was that guy sleeping? How much do these coaches sleep? I know you had a situation. I don't know if you still do it where your wife Melanie was talking about you sleep like four hours a night. She was finally like, hey, bro, come on, let's go. Well, Melanie's like, like, she put it to me like, this is not fun anymore. You're going to die because you're not going to make it. It's like, it's not, you know, I remember listening to the Joe Rogan show and uh, Matthew Walker, who wrote the book, Why We Sleep, said, I listened to the whole thing. It's like two hours and 20 minutes. And he says, hey, um, there's one stat that you really need to pay attention to. And that stat is very simple. Those who sleep the least die first it's a it's a fact so the day i heard that i said oh i said i'm yeah. i'm certainly I'm certainly winning that contest and i don't <laughs> want that's a contest that i don't want to win so yeah i need i need to work on that i mean i'd be i'd be lying if i sat here and wasn't that nodding my head like oh yeah I, I need that's something i need to find time for in my life which is like i need to find a way to to, to, to get more rest just because of the hours i talked about where i work mornings and it's crazy and uh so sometimes that that thing leads me. I remember I would text you in the morning when I started to do mornings because I knew you were the only person on earth who, who I knew that was going to be up at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> and it made me feel good. It did. Yeah. You know, it was 2015. I, I was remember. up in the in northeast Louisiana. I was texting you, like telling you what I was doing, and you were texting me back, and and you know, kind of keeping me going. And yeah, Coach, I don't know. It's just one of those things that blows my mind about how. The energy he was he he has sustained right. over his whole coaching career. Right. So to answer your question, I'll tell you this: I firmly yeah. believe that there are certain people on this planet, and that I'm not insinuating don't need sleep. Everyone needs a, a great amount of sleep. Sleep is one of those powerful. I call it vitamin S. Sleep is everything, right? Yeah. But 
you got to think like Coach Reed is one of those unique people in this world that has the ability to make his mind like a sniper rifle and go right at his target and he will absolutely die. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no. He gets it done and he does things that most people, listen, I'll tell you another quick one. He wanted to save money for recruiting. He was recruiting people in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts. He drove. He drove up there on a Friday or a Thursday, scouted, was at the day before practice on Friday in Massachusetts. He drove up there to prove a point, to save money. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. That's like, do you know, really, how much sleep do you think he got on that trip? Oh, I, that's that's what that's what I'm talking about, dude. I'm not to belabor the point, but what do you think he was averaging? Like three, four hours, and I mean, in season, think about it. Dude. Yeah, I mean, it's you crazy, know? and he's not. He's still kicking and stronger than ever. So, you know, yeah. I mean, it's he's he's a unique guy. So, Pete, talk. You know, you you leave Richmond. You said you were out of the nest, so you started to, you know, I was out of the nest, and right away, dude, I was like, I I, I just kind of started to. Look, man. Uh, I mean, to get right into it, my, my, you know, you know, my father's family. You, I don't know what it is, man, but you're from that area. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of inherent addiction mm-hmm. in that part of the country. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I, and I don't want to be say that that's who knows, man. But that's that's just my experience with that area of the country. My father side of the family, we say that alcoholism didn't run in in his family. It galloped, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. there was alcoholism all throughout. My dad's family and you know his father died of alcoholism uh yeah his sister did and every a lot of like my cousins and stuff really uh, some died from from addiction and some ended up in prison and I, I don't know like it wasn't really talked about it just wasn't it wasn't a discussion so the moment i started to drink man i tell people I, when I was in eighth grade, I would go to the dance and I would be terrified. And then I started to drink in like ninth and tenth grade, and I couldn't wait to get there. And that's that was kind of always my experience with alcohol. And when I got out of Richmond, it was all I wanted to do, man. I r- really was. I, it was all I wanted to do, and I didn't even know it. My I was already blowing up my life. I lived in down in Philadelphia. Ecstasy had just kind of come on the scene, and I was taking this stuff like Tic Tacs. And I, I mean, you're feeling, you're making yourself dumber i mean that's the one drug and i did them all but i can remember waking up the next day being like i i am i am way short you know three bottles short of a six pack right now mentally i'm not with it and you know mcshay threw me a lifeline todd mcshay he and i were super close at richmond and he said i got this opportunity you'd be perfect for because i did have like you know some natural skill god-given talent i think Mm -hmm. we all do and todd had been witness to some of that and he gave me an opportunity. So I came, I, I moved up to New York from Philadelphia and we started working together. I work in a football part-time for an agent and part-time for a football scouting service. And, and it was an incredible opportunity, but I wasn't ready for that either. You know, I, I, I was not, I was not focused on, I mean, I was focused on my job a little bit and I think I had some periods of success, but it was, when, when am I going to party? You know, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. was the number one thing. And so the structure we had at Richmond, once that was stripped down, I was up to my own devices and my own devices were were, were, were no good for me. No good. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I mean, it's Todd throws your lifeline in. in I know Todd McShay is ESPN college scouting. One of our friends worked very hard to get where he is. How do you how do you change your behavior? Because this is like this is a journey, and I have a someone I I know very well who's close to me who you know went through this process, and we talk about it a little bit. And I'm always you know to change your behavior is it's one of the hardest things in the world. Most people don't change. That's that's a fact. So how do you what how did you get yourself out of this, Pete? Because you're partying, oh, you're I, drinking. Well, I mean, talk to me about the journey. It's not it, it, it's not of me to get out of this. Uh, it's it's really way bigger than me, right? Like I, you know, you could get into all the details and you could be here all day talking about it. But I go, I 
Todd and I are working together. Uh, and, and, you know, I start to do, we're living in New York city. We're living on the upper East side and I start to do cocaine. And it's just, you know, the moment, the first time I did that, it was like, okay, I think I want to do this every day for the rest of my life. Like normal people don't do that. And, uh, and, and so I just quickly went off the tracks and, you know, I disappeared from New York. I'm back home in Philadelphia. I'm living with my, my parents. Uh, and you know, I, I, I wrecked a car. I ended up bottoming out at like 26. Right. And then I started to go to 12 step meetings, started to go to AA and it started to work, but I wasn't ready, dude. I just wasn't ready. I had to be, you know, sometimes people need to be a part of, and I, I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't committing a hundred percent to, to being sober. And I still had one foot hanging out with my buddies who were great guys, but they like, they, they could handle smoking marijuana and drinking. I couldn't. So I go back to doing that and I get jobs working in the NBA and I have these, you know, your egos pumping, you're traveling with teams and you're doing, I was doing public relations, but really what I was just doing was prolonging my, um, my pain and drinking and using. And I was also, you know, it's cheating death, man. Remember now I got, I got a, I got cardiomyopathy. Um, and I'm addicted to coke, cocaine and clonopin, you know, it's just, a, uh, and, and alcohol was always my baseline. So I, I bottomed out when I was 33, man. And, uh, I mean, so many things happened and, you know, your bottom, um, you can always dig deeper, dude. And one day, one day I was going to, I was going to meetings, uh, you know, AA meetings and I couldn't. I couldn't stop drinking. You know, I, I, before when I wanted to stop, I could go to meetings and I could stop and dude, I could not stop. And, uh, I, I, I went to, uh, I went to a meeting with the guy and this guy was like, look, man, he just shared his experience. That's what we do. And he said, my experience is I went to rehab and I got well. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I don't know what it was. It was a God thing, right? It was bigger than me, but I was basically like, this is my last chance, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of, you'll read literature associated with the Alcoholics Anonymous, which is like, let the alcoholic think it's his, his idea to get sober, you know, it's like mm-hmm. a good thing. And at that moment, I, I, I go home to my parents, right? I'm 34, I'm 33, I'm living with my parents and I put my hands on my hips. I'm like, I have an idea. I think I should go to rehab. They were like, dude, it's about time. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and away I went, dude. At 33 years old, my life's completely changed. I went to uh, I went to treatment in Pennsylvania, a place called Karen, Karen with a C, mm-hmm. and uh, I started to follow suggestions, dude. And I started to, you know, I got done rehab, and they're like, you need to go somewhere else. I'm like, somewhere else? What are you talking about? I just spent 30 days cooped up. Um, you know, we're sitting here talking on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I spent the Thanksgiving 10 years ago in, in a treatment center, and uh, I can't ever forget that. Because if I do, I'll probably drink again and end up right back there or worse. So how long were you you there for, Pete? I was there for 30 days. And at the end of my stint there, this is when the magic really started to happen, Mark. At the end of my stint there, they were like, you, we think, you know, a lot of people have this model of long-term recovery. Um, And, you know, as it was put to me, it's like a couple months for the rest of your life. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Getting that gift of desperation and having nowhere to go the gift of unemployment, right? Uh, they were like, you should go somewhere else. So I went to another, a, a, a halfway house, basically. So wait, so you go to for 30 days, and then they say you gotta, you should go to another one? Yeah, yeah, which at the time you're like, you know, and, and that was the miracle for me. I remember being like, all right, fuck it, like I'll go. Because it was working, right? I, was, mm-hmm. I bought in, when I went to rehab, I bought in. I didn't want to drink anymore, I was done. And I started to, actually talk about my feelings and be vulnerable and it started to feel good and i got i got the feelings from talking about that stuff and being open about my my pain i got i got the feeling from being honest like that that i used to get from getting high and i remember thinking okay this can work and honestly i remember being in rehab and this scientist you know you can talk about god and the higher power all you want and that works for me but man there was a there was a doctor that put you know, brain on the wall, like, uh, you know, this is your brain on drugs, you know, and six months from now, if you never drink again, here's what your brain would look like. And it was a brain that was starting to function normally again. And they were like, in 18 months, you'll almost be back to totally normal function. And I remember thinking like, so you're telling me I could go to the movies and have Reese's Pieces and a Coke and I'll enjoy the movie like I did when I was a kid. And the guy was like, yup. 
And I remember thinking, my God, I'm in. And wow. Uh, wow. and then so I go to the the extended care place, and I, I you know I've told this story, dude. I I, I was working in the NBA. I you know worked with Todd and living in in New York, and kind of you think you're you think you're a big deal, and you're not, but at least you think you do. Well, you get a job working. I worked at a Kentucky Fried Chicken in the halfway house, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and and I was terrified. I walked into KFC. I was like, you know, I looked at the register like I was trying to fly, uh, you know, an F one fifty or not an F one fifty, but an F four, or, or you know, like a, like a fighter pilot. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and uh, I had to learn all this stuff again, you know. Uh, and, uh, it was there that I, I got, the ego has to be smashed and my ego was smashed. And, uh, I was given a foundation to appreciate, have gratitude. And, uh, you know, that's how I found, that's how I changed my, my, my attitude. That's how I changed my actions. That's how I changed my life. I was broken. Um, and I, and I had nowhere to go and that got me into right thinking, you know, Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, I don't, you know, listen, I don't, you know, what's interesting. I, when I was, I, I talked about it a few times, but, you know, after football ended for me, and you know, I've been playing football since I was six years old. And then I'm, yeah. now I'm 30, I don't know if it was like 29, 30 years old, and I'm done in, in um, Montreal. Now, Montreal is a party city. Like you, yeah. don't, you don't want to leave there, and I knew. And, and not, you were the toast of the town. Well, I don't know about that, but come on, come on. Yeah, no, I, I know this. The Montreal Alouettes hadn't won a CFL Grey Cup championship, whatever, since 1977 under Marv Levy. We won. It was a lot of attention, and we were treated really special. It was like, I don't think that this is normal. And I, I never wanted that to end. And I looked at myself one day and I was thinking, this is not who I am. Like, this is not what I do. I don't even want to be here. But I had great friends there, but I had such a void in my life. And I think it's just, not that it's this, natural. This is when you were done playing? It was when I was done playing. I think that yeah. we kind of have this moment where... I'm going to turn my head and not let this stuff bother me. And it's like, like I'm not going to engage and I'm not going to um, start anything too serious and I'm going to numb myself to, with whatever behaviors. Yeah. Uh, it yeah, could yeah. Be, with, with the tension, yeah. with people kissing your ass. Of course, of course. And it's like, you need, a good friend of mine said, you need to get going. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you, you can't just like work out all day and like just train and party. And I was like, He's absolutely right. Yeah. Like he's absolutely right. And I, I think that you going through that, what you went through, helped you lay down an amazing foundation for the rest of your life. And oh, 100%. It, I mean, 100%. It, it was painful, though, right? It was painful. Dude, it, I mean, it was rough. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I moved from a rehab into a halfway house. Dude, I'm in a, I'm in a house with eight other dudes nine other dudes and some of them don't want to be there mm-hmm. you know uh, and uh you know i, I remember i opened the, the drawer the dresser drawer it was supposed to be mine right uh, the, the first day i moved into this halfway house and there was a bowl of, of dried out spaghettios in there i was like dude you know i'm trying to go to bed this one guy is snoring like crazy the uh, this other guy is getting up and smoking cigarettes in the room dude i'm 33 you know like i'm like you know I, i'm like wow and uh my first day, I wrote my, dude, my, <laughs> you couldn't even, we didn't have computers, we didn't have phones, and we used to go to the library to, like, kill time. If you had a job, you'd go to the library, and I remember writing my brother an email from the library, like, you got to come get me out of here, and the person that worked at the library was like, yeah, you need to, you need to leave, you can't be sending personal emails. I was like, <laughs> I was like man, tough times, but, you know, I, I can talk about all that stuff. Uh, and, and those are the esteemable acts, dude, right? Like, like for the first time in my life, I learned how to do stuff on my own. I learned how to process feelings and emotions without getting drunk, you know, for so long, every emotion I had, I, I didn't even know what I was doing. Right. I was just pouring substance on it and I wasn't learning how to feel. I wasn't processing any emotions. And, uh, I was a, I was a wreck, but by being a wreck, 
Um, and by literally turning my life over, like you said, by changing my actions, I got, a, I got the opportunity every day now to embark on a life beyond my wildest dreams. It's just whether I, it's whether I want to do the work, dude, you know? Yeah. And, and at, w at what point, cause I look, I always talk about like the person I was from like birth to like the end of football and well into my thirties and early forties, like. I was like a super angry, aggressive person. Like I'm a polite person and I'm a respectful person 99% of the time. But, you know, I had like this angry streak in me. Well, dude, I'll be, you know, you reminded me of my dad. And like, that's like, it's not a negative thing, but like you guys were strong uh, men uh, from the same area of the country um, who part my language you just didn't want to fuck with. And 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 you didn't want to make them upset, you know. Uh, and and there was a little bit of fear there, you know. Mm. Um, and and uh, it was a there was a, a great respect I had for you, but it was also like you do not want to cross this guy. Well, we and I, and I learned that. That being said, I learned that, you know, basically you're like that because you're an insecure, scared person. Yeah. And like you don't ever talk about what's going on in your life, your feelings, you're not vulnerable. And I'll tell you, like that took a long time for me to go, wait a minute. I remember I went to that retreat. There was a Vipassana retreat. I told you about that. Um, it was 10, yeah, 10 days, that. no phone, no talking. You look down, you eat twice a day. I lost like 12 pounds. You don't talk at all? There's zero talking. Zero. That in itself makes people crazy, by the way. Yeah. Really, it makes people crazy. And like, you start with 70 men and 70 women. You meditate 10 hours a day in complete silence. Each session is an hour. And, you know, you got to do 10 days. And the reason they tell you to do 10 days is because things don't, you don't start becoming aware and understanding who you are until like the seventh day. And I can't tell you how many people have left and then they they basically don't stick it out and then they have to come back and they're so close. Um, but it took me all that time for me to have my aha moment and say, wait a minute, all the stuff that I say about or think about other people or judge, that's me. Yeah. And I got to work through this because I don't want to be a 70 year old man, you know, or 60 year old man or 50 year old man and be an asshole. I don't want to be a person that, and, and look, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. It's what I thought and what I knew. Yeah. I'm tired of the insecurity. I'm tired of all this stuff. I don't want people to look at me and say, you know, I, I see certain people who are so successful in life and they act like children. It just makes me, it, it's crazy. And I think, when did you have your moment where you're like, you know, I gotta, I gotta start dealing with some of my, my things and, you know, my, internal dialogue when did you have that aha moment i think it was it's funny it was like you know i knew that i had to stop drinking right i mean i knew that but i had no idea what was going to come with it so being an alcoholic when you get into recovery and like 12-step work you you stop drinking to save your ass right you stop drinking to save your life for me and then all of a sudden you don't realize you're involved in this program where you know, you have to face all this shit. You know, like we got, you know, if you know anything about the 12 steps, we do a four step, which is like you take, it's called a personal inventory, um, a fearless and searching moral inventory. So I look at myself my whole life. I write down on a list of paper, all the people I have resentments against, you know, uh, Natalie, the girl, when I was a freshman who basically, uh, I dated for three days and she dumped me at the, at the high school dance. You know, I treated women poorly for a decade or more because I'm still pissed off about how this, how this girl broke my heart. But that's you real. Know? That's real. That's it's real. real, dude. And so like, and, and, and here I am running around the six, five, 230 pound big guy acting like he's tough. And I'm the biggest pussy in the room. Um, and, uh, and, and, but, but my fear is being taken out on other people. So when I started to get into inventories like that, I started to realize, okay, I am responsible for my part in all this stuff. And, you know, regardless of what happens to me, I control my attitude. That's the one thing I control. 
uh, because stuff's going to happen around you in life, man. And it's just, it's just going to go down how it's going to go down. And at some point I realized how I react to it is going to be everything. And I think that point was when I got into work in the 12 steps, um, you know, after you write that inventory down, you, you share it with a sponsor and, uh, or a priest or whoever, you know, mm -hmm. there's no like stringent rules and, uh, you share it with another person though. And, you know, a hundred times, I, I'd say in my experience, a hundred percent of the time, the person you share it with is going to be like, yeah, so what? You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. whatever you think you did, that's the worst thing in the world that you've carried around shamefully for your whole life. It's all bullshit. You got to let it go. You got to let it go or it's going to follow you and it's going to be this, you know, it's going to just be an albatross for the rest of your life. Right. And, 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 and here's another thing, dude. You help people all the time, Mark. You are a man of service. If you want to be of service and you want to help people, you got to get out of your own way. You got to get all this crap out of the way. Otherwise, you're going to be of service to nobody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Uh... You say it, but you know a lot of people don't want to take that inventory and take that step. And I and and I get it. I get yeah. it. it. It's like a fearful thing. Someone told me this many years ago. They said, you know why they don't want to like deal with it, Mark? Because even it gives them a sense of who they are in security. Now, if they venture outside that personality or that behavior, they're scared. They don't know what's going to happen. At least they know that, right? But to uh, change is so scary for people. You know, it's it really terrifying, and, and 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 that goes back to your question. I didn't really have a choice. I didn't look, man. Like like I think we've established, I wasn't the most thoughtful young man in the world. So when I was faced with this stuff, it was out of desperation. Mm -hmm. I, I I just walked into a room. I said, I I I got nothing left. I I need I need somebody to help me. And they were like, okay, well, if you want to get well, here's what you got to do. And I was like, whatever it takes. So I had to be pushed to that point to be able to confront all that stuff that can, you know, no matter who you are, whether you've, you know, whether you've got a problem with drinking or whether you've got a problem with eating or whether you've got a problem with your self-esteem or whatever, there's a way out, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's taking a hard look at yourself and that shit ain't easy. Nice. So tell us what, what you're doing today, Pete, because you, I talked to Pete the other day and um, he was on a run and he, oh. said, he said, it's interesting, Mark, I don't just go on the run. Now I do the, the run walk. I do the intervals. That's called age, Pete. That's called age. <laughs> I was talking to my girlfriend and I was like, you know, and it's true. I said, you know, I was telling Mark, I, I was telling her about you. And I was like, I told him how, you know, I, I run walk and then I, you know, sometimes you forget who you're talking to. And I'm like, uh, you know, who, what have I got? What have I got to prove anymore? And you're like, come on, man, yeah. your best years are ahead of you. That's right. And, uh, and it's true, too. I mean, that's that's the mentality. I, I need to find that gear sometimes. Sometimes I'm just trying to 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 slog through, you know, and this goes back to what I'm doing today. You know, I I, I do like you. I do a podcast and try to put out there and help people. Um, it's called the payoff with Pete. And I had this guy on today who was 90 year old guy. He was, a, he's a, I was flew 159 combat missions of Vietnam. He's sober 30 years, you know? Um, and, uh, he talked about, you know, he, he, he is wants to be in heaven in the afterlife, but mm -hmm. you know, there's an opportunity to live heaven here on earth as this guy put it. Wow. And he said, you right. I mean, and, and, and that's kind of what you were talking about the other day. It's like, dude, you don't just want to get through the day. You want to embrace it. You want to appreciate it. You want to be grateful. So to answer your question about what I'm doing today, I'm trying to turn my will over, you know, every day and to do and to do the right thing um, and to stay, stay out of my way. And, you know, that's from a spiritual side because of some of the tenants um, I picked up through, you know, getting sober. But for work, you know, and this is goes back to what I was saying about you, just to kind of round out the, the early morning stuff. You know, I get up at 2 a.m. I drive to work. Um, I'm a news anchor. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I'm on the air at 4.30. I'm off the air at 7. And then I'll do some other stuff. Uh, you know, I try to I try to use the platform for good. I didn't, you, you know, um, it's uh, I love what I do, but the hours are a grind. 
and I uh, and I also you know I think it's something you can relate to. Um, for the first time in my life, look, dude, I still have plenty of work to to do in my career, and and there's goals I have yet to accomplish for sure. But at the same time, too, I'm finally starting to say no to stuff, uh, and I'm having trouble because, like, you know. I was always just so happy to be asked to do something. Mm-hmm. Hey, do you want to work this football game? Hey, we work this baseball game. And I started to do baseball play by play for ESPN this past spring. And that's awesome. And that's something I'll never turn down. But then there's other stuff where I'm just running around doing every, everything. And, and you know, my girlfriend's like, dude, what are you doing? You're, you know, you're 44. You're going to, you got to rest. Yeah. Um, and I do. I'm, so I'm working towards that balance now, but yeah, you, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you have to kind of sit, you still have to learn to sit still with yourself and breathe a little bit and, uh, and enjoy it because you don't want to be worn down all the time. No, not at all. And, and that's, that's kind of what we're, I'd like to, you know, close off with, like, let's talk about Pete, you have a job that you're around athletes, you see behaviors, you, you're, your front row seat to psychology of sports. Um, a lot of the things that you learn, the lessons you learned in your life are going to help you, but you could pass those on to younger people. If you were giving a young person advice, a younger Pete going through college and he's about to deal with, you know, r- dating, relationships, parties, alcohol, drugs, um, education, uh, he's got to know what he wants to do for the rest of his life. What advice would you give a young person? I just gave you a lot, but where would you start? No, I, I, that, that, I often um, look back with regret on how I handled my just being an athlete. Uh, I, 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 I used it like a drug almost. I, I, once I started, and this is just my thing um once i started to experience success and got attention for sports you know you see your name in the paper you're on the news i really thought that my shit didn't stink i didn't mark i didn't have that like like that gear that you found and uh I, anybody coming behind me or anybody coming up i i i looking back i just wish i gave 150 percent all the time because i didn't and it hurts to say that but you know i i kind of would lift just enough to look good or I would lift, you know, doing biceps before, you know, a practice or a game, which is like part of that, you know, comes with ego and stuff like that. But I, I didn't sell out. I would tell kids today, if you want to separate yourself from the rest of the competition, you got to sell out one, because somebody's always watching. Somebody is always watching. And two, because you want to get the most out of your potential because you got one shot at this. I mean, you got four years of playing team sports in high school. If you're lucky, you got four more in college. And those are probably some of the best years of your life. So to cap, and, 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 and Mark, you are a perfect example of that, of a guy who, you played in the NFL. You won a championship in the CFL. You got everything out of your body that you could have gotten. And it was good enough to get you to the NFL. You know, and I don't think anybody would have bet on you when you were in eighth grade at Durfee High School, right? <laughs> no. no, I'm serious. No, no. I. You know what's interesting? I was driving home, I think it was two nights ago. God, I'm pissed at you that you you actually work so damn hard. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I remember, you know, uh, a gentleman that I'm working with now, um, he's like a big tech guy. He's had a lot of success. He, he asked me several questions and he said, do you kind of feel like you're getting interviewed? And I said, yeah, I do. And he's like, it's by design because, uh, you know, they, they want to know who, who they're working with. And I said, you know, I wasn't very good at sports, and that's the truth. And I know you understand what I mean. When I say that, I'm not trying to sound humble. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Uh, you know, but people think like, people think like, yeah. I play people the think NFL. you're lying now, yeah, right? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I play, I, the, you, you're looking at 30 years later. You're not looking at like how it started from, you know, birth to like 16, right? So my point is I basically got where I am in life in football and sports and whatever, call it whatever you want, through effort. Like really, through effort. And and when I say effort, it's not like going beast mode and going crazy. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about someone going to the gym on Monday and Wednesday, and Mark went Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's it. Someone doing, instead of doing four sets of a squat, uh, they did two. I did five. Do you understand what I mean? So, oh, I know what and, you mean. and it adds and up. I, it's great. Yeah, well, dude, and that's kind of my point is, and that's, again, speaking to the, the younger person, those lonely hours, right, that you put it, you know, and I'm not talking about, and look, social media is great. I love social media. I'm on social media. I think it's great for people. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, <laughs> this is, I'm going to say this because you're affiliated with all the superstar athletes, but like a guy like Ben Simmons, like, Stop working out with your shirt off and showing me you can hit a jump shot on social media. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's a, that's an example. And just my opinion as a pissed off Sixers fan. But like, you know, the the lonely work, right? Who, what are as a kid? What are you doing to by yourself to make yourself better that nobody knows about, mm -hmm. and people will find out about on the stage, on the playing field, on the court. Like, what are you doing that's going to separate you? Because at some point, bro. It's coming down to you're going to either win or you're going to lose. It's, it's, it's coming for all of us, whether you, your natural abilities are not going to supersede your lack of effort. It, I mean, it's it's so sooner true. or later. It's so true. And sooner or later, that, that chicken's coming home to roost. So you've basically got to figure out yourself, are you going to work harder than the next guy? Because, dude, you have pe young people – Looking back, you know, and that's that's the miracle is to be able to think like you thought at those, that age, Mark, which, you know, that is special from your mother, from whoever. But you had the ability to understand that hard work would do that for you or that that was the only thing, you know, your only way out, whatever. Uh, not everybody thinks like that. And that's what separates the great ones from the from the good ones, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, I, I had as Coach Reed said when he was on the show, he's very concerned that young people are losing their um, ability to want to better themselves and push themselves to places where they pr it's probably not going to happen. They need the in they, and, and then they don't fulfill their potential. And I and I say this all the time, if if I see someone who's really asking real questions and they want real answers, I'll tell them point blank. I'll say, dude, you have, do you realize you have a responsibility? And they say, what do you mean? I'm like, you have a responsibility to, to do your very best and become what you're supposed to become because you have to show the people who love you in your circle what's possible. Like you have to show people what's possible. Like, it's an obligation. You have to do it. And if you don't feel that way, look around. You're not going to wake up and be Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or, you know, uh, Tom Brady. You have to dig. Life is short. You have to make it happen. And if you don't start now, you're running behind, man. And I'm not telling you to kill yourself. I'm telling you to pick something. It doesn't matter what it is. Be good at it. And then you lay a foundation. It's not about the thing. It's about you caring to be good at something and going all in. Did you did you see that by, by, from, from Tom Brady when you were when you were with the Patriots? So I'll, I'll tell you, I, Randy West. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell a quick story. Before. Go go go. So when I was working in football after college, I was working. Um, we we would cover NFL games and stuff. And, uh, when I was working with Todd and we were working with a, an agent and uh, I, I was at the, the uh, Hall of Fame game in Canton. You guys were playing the 49ers in 2001, I think. And uh, I, 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 I got a chance to see you after the game. And dude, right away, you gave, you went into your bag. You're like, Susan, take these shorts. They were like New England Patriots 96 shorts. And I wish I still had them. Oh, man. And then you were like, this is the greatest play of all time. I want you to meet Willie McGinnis. And I, and I got to take <laughs> Willie McGinnis' hand. <laughs> Uh, and you introduced me to Tom Brady, and it was so cool. And and uh, you know that, by the way, is just is Mark Magna. I mean, like here you are, a guy trying to make the team, and you're introducing some some jackass you picked out football with him. I mean, that is that that's family, though. Oh you know? man. Um, and so, but but back to you. So, what did you see? I remember meeting Tom Brady when you were teammate, but what did you see from him? So, 
uh, three of my cousins were at practice at Bryant College, and and I remember the same thing happened. That's where you way. guys have preseason. Yeah, right? and I said, um, hey, you got to meet this guy, Tom Brady. He's going to be like the next best quarterback. He's special. And they said they it's on video. It's in the movie, the film. They said, no, no, Mark, we don't we don't want to meet him. It's okay. Like they thought he was a scrub. And I said, no, you don't understand. Like this is the guy. Bledsoe goes down. They're gonna put. Bishop, uh, John Friesen, maybe Bishop. Michael Bishop. Michael Bishop. And then fourth is Brady. I said, yeah, right now. I said, Bledsoe goes down next year, Brady's going in, trust me. And they were like, how do you know that? I'm like, because I know. I see I see what he does in practice, and I see the way the coaches are tickled by, this guy is not that bad, which is code for, he's really good, don't tell anyone. Uh. So when he was in practice, he was – diligent, sharp, crisp. He wanted to do everything right. And it was noticeable. Now, if you're, listen, I have enough to worry about. I'm trying to make the team. I'm on defense. Just, I don't know if anyone out there knows this, but when you're trying to learn Belichick's defense and you're not really allowed to make one mistake, people don't make mistakes. You can be out of position a little bit, but you really don't make mistakes. But when you're focused on what you're doing and you're seeing that, that speaks volumes. And he was a focused, crisp with his steps, sharp with his throws. And I was like, yeah, I think we all kind of notice what's going on there. He's not a backup quarterback. He's something special. And everyone was kind of like, we're not necessarily worried, if you know what I mean. And that's kind of what happens in the NFL, right? You don't, they, they won't go on about this quarterback so somebody can poach him. Right. They're not, they, they, they're not going to say, like, I remember Parcells when I was with the Jets. He had two guys on the practice squad. People don't know this, and I reference this story a lot, but, you know, in a practice squad, you make good money. And there's nothing that's – let's say Parcells had a guy on the practice squad for the Jets that another team wanted to poach and put on their active roster. That's what the practice squad is for, by the way. Parcells would say, okay, you're going to go with that other team to make how much? Two hundred fifty thousand. I'm gonna pay you three hundred thousand to stay on the practice wow. squad here. And they would go, "You can't do that." And he said, "Show me the rule that I can't do that. I can do whatever I want." <laughs> so he was the first one to do that because his practice squad was like loaded with studs. I remember Geno Bell was on the from Arkansas. I mean, he yeah. was one of the best defensive tackles I saw, and he was on the practice squad. Someone went down. He goes in the game. That guy starts and holds his own. That's yeah. That's saying a lot. So. Um, coaches always had tricks to keep like great guys on the roster, but you didn't really know who they were. And by the way, you, they didn't want you to know who they were. Yeah. So, Pete, man, this has been amazing. I can't thank you enough. Um, Mark, what a great way to kick off. I, I, I don't know if you were trying to like, like th- this holiday and I, this is, uh, you know, to be able to share this time with you, man, it's, it means the world, dude. I mean, it's, 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 it, it's such a shot in the arm. You know, whatever I do for the rest of the day today, I'm going to be feeling really good. I'm going to be feeling lighter. And it's conversations like these that I think make me and other people who are willing to have them better. You know, it's uh, this is the kind of shit that, you know, I, I wouldn't be talking to you like this if I was still drinking or still, you know, in yeah. my own way all the time. Yeah. It's just, it's a special deal. These, these, these are special relationships. And to be able to share stuff like this with you is awesome. I'm super stoked for you, man. I'm super happy we get to talk. You're one of my... Uh closest friends in life because we have a lot a lot of connections and you know we got to talk more man let's 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 schedule some phone calls at like 2 30 a.m <laughs> i'm all about it and one one last thing if you haven't seen a kid from fall river yet you need to get your head out of your anus and go see it because it's about it's it's unbelievable everybody in my life that saw it said they were blown away and that's coming from me that's not coming from mark or anybody else no, i appreciate that it's um, awesome dude. so pete's referencing just a kid from fall river and um you know pete's in it and not only is he in it but like this the the film is not made to boast about mark magna i want everyone to know that the film was actually made by randy west of monarch productions one yeah. of our spider alums who's an incredible human being, one of my close friends. He was just at my house this past weekend. And he's the best. He is, a, he, the, he's the best. One, he's one, he is one of the 
most special stand up high character individuals you would ever meet in your life. Yeah. And he wanted to yeah. make this film for at risk youth to show kids. He was a teacher and a high school football coach and he said they need more positive examples. So yeah. he drove to fifty interviews all over the country and Canada and gathered film with no budget because he cared enough about passing something on to society and he has two kids to show you can do something positive if you put in the work and you focus on positive habits. Well, dude, that's why I bring it up, and it's not—it's not a kid from Bull River. It's just a kid, my bad. Or, that's okay. But 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 it's that it can keep giving, dude. Like this is a film; it's evergreen, it's timeless. Uh, I think that young people need to watch it because it, it actually—it's funny how things come full circle. It's exactly what I was talking about earlier that I couldn't find. I couldn't find this in myself, but you did. And it's well, if, if you can show it to, to younger, younger people and let them see it, um, it is terribly inspirational. Oh, thank you so much, Pete. And thank you, Randy West, for making something so incredible. That guy, I don't know how he does it. He's, yeah. he's amazing. But um, Pete, you're the man. Have a wonderful holiday. Give my best to your family and your significant other. Uh, tell the doctor that is your significant other that you know if it doesn't work out with you i know a lot of other people <laughs> i'm kidding i'm, 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 I'm sure she, man, like you uh, said. yeah i'm she i'm sure she's wonderful and you both uh are wonderful together give my very best to her i love you brother and uh love you too man thank you for your time i'll talk to you soon all right mark it was a pleasure okay bye bye bye